Hello everyone, this is my tutorial on question A1 of the 2014 exam. In this question we have a cyclist moving in a circle. So, uh, like all of my other problems, uh, I'm going to draw a diagram. So here's our cyclist, and it says that the cyclist is at an angle theta to the vertical. Cyclist is moving in a circle of radius r, and we're asked to find omega. What is its angular velocity? So, first let's establish a few facts. Uh, one, there has to be some kind of frictional force to keep the cyclist from not slipping, right? Because if there was not friction uh, about the point of contact, they would slip and fall over. So, first fact is that there is friction. And, but we're not told what that friction is. Uh, the second fact is that uh, in part A of the problem, we're given that the height of the cyclist is much, much smaller than R. So what this means is that about each, every small piece of mass on the cyclist will experience about the same amount of centripetal force. And that total centripetal force, uh, we can basically say it's acting at the center of mass. So this means uh, same force throughout. Same force throughout. Oof. And the third one is going to be a force diagram. Uh, we do have the force of gravity, this, and there would be a force normal, and a force friction, which would provide the centripetal force. So, in this problem, you may wonder, how are we ever to find what omega is if we don't know what the force is, what the force of friction is? Uh, first of all, we know that in centripetal motion, we can also look at the centrif cent cent centrifugal force. And we can only do this in a non-inertial frame. So if you were an observer and you were standing here, you are in a inertial reference frame because you are not accelerating. So the only forces you observe here is gravity, friction, and normal force you see all the correct forces. Uh, something to keep in mind for uh, observing reference frames is that if you're in a non-inertial reference frame, if you're in a non-inertial reference frame, uh, you do have to, uh, some of the forces will not be able to be observed, so you would have to use fictitious forces. Fic Fictitious forces. So, in circular motion, in this case, uh, if our reference frame was with the rod, we were accelerating with the unicyclist, or I'll just call it a rod for now, uh, there would be a centrif uh, centrifugal force. So you would see something like this, a centrifugal force at the center of mass, which, was, which is about a distance, let's say it's a distance L, uh, from here to here, yeah, and then there would be a centrifugal force, force centrifugal, uh, and then there would be, you know, gravity. And there would be a normal force, and the frictional force. Force of friction. Immediately looking at this force diagram, we can see that uh, we can actually establish a fact that this rod is in equilibrium. And what this means is that is that the sum of the forces will uh, be equal to zero. And the sum of the torques. And since we don't know what uh, friction 
uh, is, we can actually work with torques, because if we choose this as our uh, point of contact, our axis of rotation, we won't have to account for these two forces. So we can do that sum of the torques is equal to zero. So in this case, we know that the torque of gravity and the torque of the centrifugal force, which is equal to mv squared of r, it's simply the centripetal force, but you know, in the opposite direction. We can establish that uh, mv squared of r times this, times this distance l, and then uh, is equal to the force of gravity, which is mg. Oh, and I do not, it's not a, uh, okay, so I did not account for the angle. Since it's acting this way, and the angle, if we draw, like, okay, here, I'll, I'll make a bigger picture to make it easier to see. So we have a rod. We have a rod. We've got a force this way. And the angle we're given is this angle right here. And if we draw, actually there is no need for that. We can just do this. Uh, this would be theta, and this would be 90 minus theta. So the torque really is sine of 90 minus theta, which is also equal to cosine theta. This is cosine theta. And then this is equal to mg. And here we could also turn this into our force of gravity arrow. And it would be mg sine theta. Times L. mgl sine theta. And when it's moving in circular motion, we know that omega that uh, omega is equal to v over r so v is omega r so what we can do is we can do turn uh, plug in uh, omega r for v squared and we get m omega squared r l cosine theta equals mgl sine theta and if we solve for omega we will get Omega is equal to G over R tan theta, and then we'll take the square root of that. So this is the answer to part A, and we simply just use torques to find what omega is. In part two of this problem, uh, now the height does matter. The height is no longer much, much smaller than R. So uh, now let's just redraw our diagram. So what this means is that no longer does each part of the of the rod, the cyclist, experience the same centrifugal uh, cent centripetal force, and we have established that the centripetal force is equal to m omega squared r. So since our distance r is uh, changing, see, for each each of these uh, small pieces of mass, since they all maintain the same omega, see this omega, uh, this omega is the same for all pieces of the mass because it's moving around the circle. We don't want the cyclists to break up into different pieces because they're moving at different uh, angular velocities. So if the r is changing, that means each piece experiences a different force. Therefore, we can't just simply use torques about the center of mass. But what we can do is we can do a summation. So now that we have established that uh, the higher it gets, the smaller the centri uh, centripetal force, therefore the smaller, tor the, smaller the torque in the non-inertial reference frame. So it looked like something. It looks something like this, and then we still have the force of gravity uh, over here. So now we have to find a new. Let's let's work one piece at a time. Let's find the torque of the uh, centrifugal force, uh, and we'll just call it uh, torque C. Now we know that it's no longer just a single torque at the center of mass. Now it's a sum of 
uh, the small individual uh, torque contributions. So what this means is we're going to have to set up an integral. And this will be an integral of, and we'll take this over here. Since we're doing for tiny pieces of mass, experiencing centrifugal forces, it'll be dm, dm, times uh, omega squared, that does not change, uh, r, what is r? r is the distance between the piece of dm and the center of rotation. So this new r, this new r will be equal to big R minus, and you can see here that let's say we're a distance up S. We're a distance up S. Therefore, our new R is R minus R, R minus S sine theta. So then we multiply by the, the uh, distance to get our force. And lastly, to turn this into torque, we multiply it uh, by the distance from its uh, point of contact, which is the axis of uh, rotation. Uh, so then it would be multiplied by s, and we would multiply by ds, because it's the sum of all the... Wait, wait, we can't do that yet. <laughs> so we know that this uh, unicyclist will have a uh, uniform mass distribution. Uh, see, the it is a uniform rod. So what we can do is we can express uh, dm over dh as a ratio and this will be equal to the total mass over the total height and I should really call this I should really call this ds equals the total because these are for tiny little portions big um, no, no, just m over h so now we can express dm since we're not integrating by m, we're integrating from the bottom to the top, right? This, this is the summation of all the little contributions. So this would become ds, uh, dm is equal to m over h ds. And we are integrating from 0 to h. So then this becomes the integral. 0 to h of, and let's, let's pull out the constants as we do this. So m is a constant, h is a constant, uh, omega squared is a constant as well. So then it's just the integral, 0 to h, of r minus s sine theta times s ds. Uh, when you do integrate this and you uh, evaluate at the upper and lower bounds, uh, you eventually get that the centrifugal centrifugal torque is equal to m omega squared h cosine theta times r over 2 minus h over 3 sine theta. Uh, and you do know that the torque of uh, all these contributions, these centrifugal contributions, will be equal to the torque contribution of gravity at the center of mass. So uh, all you have to do now, and since it's a uniform rod, we know that the center of mass is at half of its height. So <clears throat> we simply set this equal to we simply set the centrifugal torque equal to the gravitational torque. They have to balance each other out. <clears throat> and uh, after applying a little bit of algebra, and in the end you will get that omega is equal to the square root of g over r tan theta. Now this part is uh, similar to our answer from part a times 1 minus 2 over 3 and uh, it will be 1 over this value to the negative 1 power. So what we've done is we've done an integral of all the tiny torque contributions and uh, recognize that the 
rod was at static equilibrium. 